Today we're going to be talking about unobtrusive research. Unobtrusive research is studying social life without affecting the world around us. So this can be both qualitative and quantitative. But unobtrusive methods are those in which the researcher isn't directly involved in the research process. There are some steps of separation. We have qualitative and quantitative versions of this. Under the qualitative side, we have content analysis or text analysis, computational text analysis, topic modeling. All of these are versions of understanding social reality. We also have comparative historical research, tracing the way to an outcome. What led to the impeachment of Nixon? Tracing back the steps that led to this result and then comparing that with what have other impeachments looked like. So comparative historical is an extension of a case study case study would look at one observation and do that process tracing, whereas comparative historical research looks at multiple cases. On the quantitative side, we have secondary data analysis, meaning somebody's gone out, collected surveys of individuals, and throw that up on a repository online, and we all have access to those surveys broken down into Excel sheets, observations on the rows, variables on the columns, and we use that to do quantitative data analysis. Under the qualitative side, we have content analysis. Content analysis is studying a recorded human communication. So in most cases, it's text. So this can be books, newspapers, websites, blogs, paintings, sometimes laws, like how things are written, legislation, tweets, or Facebook posts. We're really looking to what's going on, who's saying what to whom, uh, why are they saying it, how are they saying it, and what effect do these relationships between individuals represented in these texts have. Sometimes researchers, when they want to do content analysis on a video, they transcribe what's been said in the video, who's saying what to whom, why are they saying this, what is the sentiment behind what they're saying, and then we can look at the transcript and break down blocks of text. Some of the key questions that a researcher needs to have answered before they start analyzing these texts are things like, what are our definitions? How are we defining our constructs, our concepts? What are we observing? Are we observing several books? Are we looking at newspapers? Are we looking at websites? So on and so forth. How are we going to analyze the data? Well, it's really about, are you really focused on who's saying what to whom? Or what are they saying? Do they sound angry? Do they sound happy? How are you going to measure key variables? If you're interested in understanding from text how angry a person is, you're going to have to figure out what anger looks like in text. Is it the number of times they said the word angry or anger? Or do they say phrases that can be construed as angry even if they're not saying I'm mad or I'm angry? So this is something that the researcher is really going to have to figure out. You really have to sit down and think, what are the various ways we can understand if somebody's angry? It's not just saying the word mad or saying angry or saying anger. And then finally, what are your units of analysis? Are you looking at sentences, paragraphs? Are you looking at pages, chapters? Are you looking at the whole text, whether that's an interview or a whole newspaper article? All of these are the important kinds of questions that researchers need to figure out before they start analyzing their data. With content analysis, you're not really going out into the field per se, but you're analyzing data that have been brought back from the field. Units of analysis, are you going to look at the entirety of the book? So if we take books as an example, are we going to look at the whole book? Are we going to look at each page as a new unit of analysis? Are we going to look at paragraphs as a unit of analysis or lines? If we look at pages, there might be on page one, one sort of sentiment, one topic that's really talked about, and that topic proceeds to the top of page two. And then there's another topic on page two. So if we're looking at the page level, we may be incorrectly analyzing what's going on. Somebody may be very happy about topic two and topic three, all of those exist on page two, but we may code page two as severely angry just because the way they ended topic one on page two was so extreme that it overpowered the happiness or the joy of how they talked about topic two and topic three. How you code these things may be misconstrued if you're looking at the page level. Looking at the line level, you could run into the same issue. You might be better equipped to understand what's going on, what's being said, understand the sentiment if you're looking at full sentences rather than lines. And to that point, in my own experience, it's been best to look at paragraphs or chunks of paragraphs that talk about similar topics. So if paragraph two, three, and four are talking about a similar topic on one page, then we should say these are all clumped. So paragraphs would probably be the best way to go, at least in my experience. Or you can cluster these paragraphs by general topic area. 
Sampling, we talked about sampling before. When you're doing content analysis, you use any conventional sampling technique. You may want to say, I'm going to look at books that cover protest participation. So I'm going to gather every book that talked about protests. Or out of these 100 books, I'm going to randomly sample 20 books and look at how they talk about protests. So we can use simple random sampling, stratified sampling, systematic sampling. All of those could work but it's really up to the researcher to decide what's the best sampling technique to answer the research question that I'm trying to answer. Coding. So when we're talking about coding, we're talking about transforming these raw data into something standardized that can be used for analysis. Here you have an example of a researcher looking at newspapers and trying to evaluate how liberal or conservative these newspapers are. So a person says, newspaper one, the New York Times. We looked at 37 editorials from within the New York Times over a long span of time and I coded it as a two. It's generally moderately liberal. So instead of just looking at one editorial from each newspaper, this person is looking at five different newspapers and several editorials from within each newspaper. So some of them could be from 1950, some could be from 1990, some could be from yesterday. And they're just giving one general overall code for what's going on in this newspaper. And generally based on these 37 editorials, I say that newspaper one or the New York Times is moderately liberal. So they do the same thing for newspaper two. They look at a bunch of editorials over time and say, I can guess based on these 26 observations from within the second newspaper that we can code it as very conservative. They also have some other variables here, number of isolationist editorials, pro-United Nations, anti-United Nations. If you wanted to, you could further break these down. Somebody could say they gave one score to each newspaper, but it's really based on 37 observations from newspaper one, 26 from newspaper two, 44 from newspaper three. So you could break it down even further and say newspaper one, editorial one, newspaper one, editorial two, newspaper one, editorial three, all the way through 37 and then give a subjective evaluation for each editorial, and then maybe calculate a mean score for all of newspaper one. So across these 37, I get a mean score for newspaper one and do the same thing down. So that's another way. Next, we have several coding types. We have manifest coding and latent coding. So when we're talking about manifest coding, we can think of anger or romantic. How do we know if a book or a sentence or line or a paragraph or a passage is considered romantic. Well, we have two ways of approaching this. The manifest way would say, we're gonna count the number of times this passage or this sentence or this line or this page or this whole book use the word love. For example, the word love popped up 132 times. That means it must be really romantic, right? Well, no, okay, let's try this. Let's count up the number of times that it said romance or the word romantic. So manifest coding really is cut and dry, concrete terms. We're just basically counting the total number of times a specific word appeared. Whereas latent coding is trying to pull out the underlying meaning of the text, whether we're looking at the whole book or we're looking at the sentence or paragraph or passage level. It's not just looking for the word love and saying, well, it said love once in this paragraph. That means it's romantic. Instead, it takes a little bit more interrogation with the material. So you spend a little bit of time reading a paragraph or a passage, you know, a series of paragraphs, and you figure out, did that seem romantic based on my understanding of what romantic is? And then you code it. Yes, that passage was romantic or this passage was not romantic. What this is going to require is a lot more work. It's really coming up with a coding scheme or an outline for how do we know that something looks romantic or seems romantic, such that if somebody else came in and read the same passage, they would generally be able to say, yes, this passage that you coded as romantic, I also see it as romantic. So on the manifest side, you're just saying, I'm just basing this off the hard count of whether or not it said love. How many times did it say love? Or how many times did it say kiss or hug? That's how we see romantic. Whereas latent coding says, well, it's not just about saying the word love or hug or kiss. It takes a little bit more work to dig deeper and say, this may or may not feel like love, but you've got to have a good outline of what love looks like in a passage. You can think of the difference between manifest and latent coding as showing, not telling, showing love, showing care, rather than saying, I care for you, I love you. Manifest would be the telling, just saying, I love you, I'm interested in you, I care about you. Whereas latent coding would be demonstrating in various ways that you love somebody or that you care for them. So when you get to this content analysis, you're really focusing on how can I ensure that if I were to do this again, that I would code it the same way. Or if somebody else came to code that same passage, they would code it the same way. 
some of the strengths of content analysis are we save a lot of time and money. We're not going out and collecting the data ourselves. We already have the data for us. So we don't have to go out and interview somebody to get those data. Those data already exist. We can just actually download those and code those. It also allows for a quick correction of errors. So once you've coded something, you can go back and say, well, let me go look at it again and see if I actually coded it the way it's supposed to be coded. You can study processes over time. You can see how one person in their tweets or one author across their various books over time has changed the way they talked about a specific topic. So if they're talking about their experience with racism, they may focus on one kind of racism at one point and then talk about a different kind of racism at another point. And then in the middle, they may have a lull where they're not really talking about racism a lot. So we can understand how people change over time and the way that they're presenting their words basically has no effect on the subject. So people don't know that you're coding their data unless you tell them that you're coding their data. And it has high reliability. Some of the weaknesses are that it's limited to everything that's been recorded. So if something is not recorded, you can't actually code those. You'd have to go back and try to record it, write it down or transcribe what was said. But you can't say, I interviewed this person or I, somebody talked to this one person and this is the gist of what they said. We want to be accurate in what we're coding. Engaging in content analysis, you have to have the actual text of what was said. And then validity. Validity really has to do with this idea of accuracy, right? Reliability is testing it over and over again and getting similar or the same results, whereas validity has to do with accurately representing what's going on in the social world. Sometimes when people say things in interviews or when they say them via tweet, it may not be accurately representing what they think. So it's hard to go back and say, is this what you meant? Well, if we did that, we would no longer be engaging in an unobtrusive method because now we're talking to the subjects. Now we're talking to the participant and now we could be affecting their social reality. We could be affecting the outcome. We could be affecting how they choose to tweet in the future. Most people who engage in unobtrusive methods really refer to secondary data analysis as the most common unobtrusive method. You can think of content analysis as a secondary data analytic technique, but content analysis is usually more of a qualitative method. You're trying to understand meaning from text. When we say secondary data analysis, though, it usually refers to quantitative data. Secondary data analysis is using quantitative data collected by other researchers, and these are often surveys, administrative data based on businesses or corporations or schools, students at schools. We can use census data at various levels, whether that's county, state, city. You can use crime and voting data, data on education, nonprofits, organizations, and events. So there are various ways of getting your hands on secondary data. Oftentimes you don't even have to apply. You can just go to a website where the data set, the quantitative data set is hosted, and just download the data set. Make sure when you download those data sets though, you do have access to the code books. And the code books basically say this observation for this variable called vote underscore eight eight. And for observation number one, their value for vote eight eight is the number one. And you're like, I, I don't know what that means. This is why the code book is very important in secondary data analysis. Oftentimes you'll go to this website, you'll download the data set and you'll be like, okay, I'm good. But the code book will actually break down what the variable vote 88 means. You'll look at the code book and it says vote 88. It's actually the way that each participant voted in the 1988 election. You're like, oh, okay, so it's who they voted for in the 1988 election. But then you see, again, that observation has the value of one. You're like, they voted for one? That doesn't make any sense. Looking back at the code book for that variable, you'll see that one represents the Democrat. So the code book is critical. It also tells you how other variables are manipulated, how many variables are in there, how many observations or people are in there. It'll tell you who the survey firm was, what the survey firm was that collected the data, their response rate, their margin of error, all of this kind of stuff. Usually these secondary quantitative data, it's gonna tell you a margin of error, meaning there's a probability of inclusion or exclusion in the sample. So sampling is important. It's gonna tell you all of that information also, that means that it's oftentimes based on a probability sample. They'll also tell you the unit of analysis. Are you working at the individual level? Are you working at group level? Are you working at family level, organizational level? Are you working at city, county, and state level? All of these things. Sometimes secondary data come at the individual level. Sometimes they don't. So keep in mind what the unit of analysis is for the data set and think about what kind of questions you can ask and answer using these data sets. We have this thing called the ecological fallacy. You have data at the city, county, and state level and you analyze this is the likelihood that people are 
going to vote for this candidate in this city, looking at the percentage of people who voted for a specific candidate in the presidential election. The ecological fallacy is this idea that when you're studying higher levels, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who fits those criteria at the individual level also would have that same outcome. So you say, I see that having higher rates of Democrats in a city increases the percentage for Obama. Percentage increase in Democrats in an area also is related to a percentage increase in the support for the Democratic candidate in the 08 election. But that doesn't mean that if I live in an area with higher numbers of Democrats that I also support Obama. So it's saying, I found this relationship at the higher level. It doesn't necessarily apply to everybody at the lower level, the individual level. Right, so that's the ecological fallacy. Here I've also included some sources of existing statistics or secondary data. We have the Statistical Abstract of the United States. I don't know if that's still used anymore, but it's good to throw that in there. Oftentimes we're working with census data, which is population level. Every few years they do a smaller version of the census, which is called the American Community Survey, or ACS. We have Pew that does polling, Public Policy Institute of California. They have a data depot, so you can go and download data from there. We have the World Bank data catalog. We have ICPSR, the Inter University Consortium for Political and Social Research. That's another repository of a bunch of data. If you're interested in looking at existing or secondary data, I would start with these repositories, things like ICPSR. Let's say you're interested in protest. You go to the ICPSR website, type in protest, and it'll bring up all of the data sets that they have at their disposal that have a question or maybe many questions about protest. So you can go through and see which one's best fit for you. And then because it's free, especially through our universities, you can just download those data right away and start analyzing them. For future reference, I've linked data resources. And this is a data resources page from my website. And I have a bunch of different repositories and sources of data listed there. So you can go ahead and poke around and see which ones work.